pleasure of all of us indeed here at uh, uh, Vidya Bharati Foundation of Canada to welcome uh, Mr. Rajiv Malhotra. <laughs> and uh, probably as you all are, you are know, uh, Rajiv Malhotra is probably one of the most uh, spoken about uh, Hindu Indian ambassadors in North America in the recent years. It is a real privilege for us to welcome him here and uh, uh, listen to him uh, what he has to say to us. And uh, I'm sure you will all be uh, you all be educated and uh, I, we will go home saying, yeah, this is the man whom we we want to follow or uh, let, us, let us listen to his uh, writings and reading, reading his writings and listening to his lectures. So just a, a short introduction on Mr. Malhotra. Mr. Raju Malhotra is an Indian-American intellectual and a philanthropist. He works full-time with the Infinity Foundation, which is a, a non-profit organization in Princeton, New Jersey, which he founded in 1995 with his own funds to foster harmony among the diverse cultures of the world. Prior to this, he worked as a senior executive in several multinational companies as a management consultant and as a private entrepreneur spanning the computer, software, telecom, and media industries. Driven by his vision of humanity that would respect the diverse civilization of the world, many of the projects his foundation will strive to upgrade the quality of understanding of Indian civilization in the American media and the educational system, as well as among the English language educated Indian elite. The foundation has already given over 250 grants for research, education, and philanthropy, including grants to leading institutions of higher education, specialized research centers, as well as many individual scholars. It routine, routinely organizes conferences and scholarly events in the US and India that challenge Eurocentrism to bring out a more balanced worldview. Mr. Malhotra is a pluralistic outlook. Mr. Malhotra's pluralistic outlook stems from his Hindu background. He is an active writer, columnist, and speaker on a variety of topics, including the traditions and cultures of India, the Indian diaspora, America and the West, globalization and East-West relations. Ladies and gentlemen, a big welcome, a very warm welcome to Mr. Malhotra. Thank you. It's uh, an honor to be here in such a beautiful facility and so such nice vibrations uh, done on, with such love and uh, such generosity, so much uh, care. I just walked uh, to the other side also. A really phenomenal project, I must say, to the people who created it. And uh, representing one of the holiest and most spiritual centers in India is very important for us. So it's indeed a, an honor to be here. I give talks in lots of places. And there's also, there's always a certain kind of feel to a place, a kind of a signature. And here, the moment I sort of walked in, it feels like there's some kind of a very deep spiritual tranquility here. Very nice feeling here. So I'm very glad to be here. Um, I'm experienced in, uh, and tried to experiment with many uh, dharmic traditions to learn from all of them and have my own guru to follow for my own self. And then there is a scholar in me that also wants to study them, to understand them from a scholarly point of view and to compare and contrast with non-dharmic civilizations the Abrahamic civilizations, Western civilizations, and things like that. We live in a world of multiculturalism and pluralism, so diversity is good, 
Diversity means differences are there among different faiths. Difference does not mean tension, does not mean arrogance, but difference, respect, difference. So it's important to understand who we are, how we are different, how others are different. So we can explain ourselves in a very sensible way, logical way, authentic way, without feeling embarrassed, without saying there's no difference, we're like you, out of ignorance or out of embarrassment, because that happens a lot. And since our tradition is not imposing itself and wanting to convert others or, or uh, oppress others, we have no reason to be shy of who we are. We, have, we can be very proud of who we are. And this is how harmony can spread because our religion, our faith, our, our dharma has a lot to offer as an example of diversity within, within our own tradition. So we can show the world that it is possible to have many different approaches and have harmony in spite of that. Whereas in the world, in other places, if there's diversity, there may be tension and the way to resolve tension is to try and make everybody the same. So my book is called Being Different. Being Different. A lot of people say, why don't you write a book on being same? Because being same is, they feel is better. A lot of people ask me the question, isn't it better if you're all the same? I mean, that's like saying there should not be an apple and an orange and a banana and a grape. It should be just one fruit and one kind of tree. Why you need so many animals and then among animals, even dogs, there are so many kind of dogs, you know, why you need so much, maybe you just have one. The way the world has been made is built on difference, diversity of animals, plants, human beings, climates, geographical situations, cultures, languages, ideologies and all sorts of things, cuisines, music. So. To try and do away with difference is a kind of uh, viol vi violence to the world, the way it exists. It's, uh, it's, uh, firstly, it's not possible to, f people have tried genociding those who are different, tried spreading their, evangelizing their idea and denying other people the right to be different, but it never works, it just creates problems. And secondly, it's not the character of the universe to have uh, homogeneous. It is the character of the universe to be different. And from our philosophy point of view, every different thing is Brahman's roop, Naam roop. It is the form of Brahman. So there's nothing wrong if this flower is different from that flower because it's Brahman expressing itself as a red rose and Brahman as the yellow lily and the Brahman as his bird and the Brahman as that snake, everything. So this is Brahman's Leela to have expressed itself in so many ways. And for us to recognize that, recognize that there is this difference which is basically the forms of the one means we can be very relaxed about it in our culture. Whereas if the culture does not see the difference as the forms of the one, the manifestation of the one, it can be a problem. They can see this as a problem that makes them concerned. So that's the starting point that we need not have anxiety over difference. We can be comfortable, relaxed, even celebrate the difference. We can celebrate the difference. Now, the book talks about certain concepts. One of them is Western universalism. I'll explain what I mean by that. Every civilization has its own history, its own philosophy, its own values. And each civilization thinks that these are the universal values. But the West has been more successful because of its power to spread its ideas, because of English language, because of media, because of corporate spreading, because of money, because of colonialism, because of conquests. So the West over the last 500 years has become spread more successfully than Chinese or anybody else, Indian. And so its ideas have become more universal because of this spreading. And that is what I call Western universalism. And because Indians got colonized for a long time, 
it changed our education system, it changed our sense of aesthetics, it changed how we think even about ourselves. Our history has been rewritten by the colonizers, that's what we are taught. Language, local language is going away, replaced by English. Sanskrit words replaced by English words. So, because of that, this Western universalism has been exported and the colonized mind in Indians, especially the educated westernized Indians, has adopted this Western universalism as our own way. So, the next concept I have is called digestion, which means one civilization digests the other. So, now Tibetan civilization is being digested into Chinese. There will be no more Tibetan civilization left, it will just be digested into Chinese. And the Tibetan uh, monasteries and art will look like, uh, you know, museums. Museums and historians will talk about this used to be like in the pyramids in the Egyptian civilization is digested into the Greek civilization and ceased to exist. And the pre-Christian pagans got digested into Christianity. The Christmas tree, Easter, a lot of symbols and rituals and ideas of Christianity came out of the pagans. So they borrowed what was useful and the pagans were made to disappear. Similarly, Native Americans, so much was taken from the Native Americans, but they, are, they don't exist in any living, they're not thriving and living like once they did. So when a civilization is very strong, like a predator, like a predator eats a prey and it eats the prey and the prey disappears and what it does not need to digest, what it cannot digest, it excretes it out. So what is useful is taken and what is not useful is left out. Similarly, civilization can be powerful and take on and digest another civilization and that civilization which is digested no longer exists. So the question I have been thinking about and concerned about is whether, whether Indian civilization is being digested into the West. You see more and more Indian language schools being shut down and replaced by English. And you see Indian dress in the next generation becoming less. I was very sad when a friend of mine in Mumbai, uh, his wife said that our 11 year old daughter says, mom, I'm not going to wear a sari when I grow up because people will think I'm the maid. Very sad to see, to see that way. There's a little, there's a commercial in the US um, I forget which company, uh, they're trying to uh, sell some phone service for keeping contact or something with India. And the scene is little Indian boy and there's a white girl, little girl and they're playing and the girl asks him, what is the dot your mom wears on her head, on her forehead? And he says, it's so that when she comes to school to pick me up, I'll know that's my mother. So they're saying, make sure you call India, you visit India so that your kids don't get confused, that sort of thing. So the point they're making is that uh, this sort of thing is happening, we're getting digested, losing our sense of difference and distinctiveness. Now, there is a lot of history to this. An earlier book I wrote, Breaking India, talks about the history of all this. And the history was fabricated during the colonial era. It served a certain agenda for the colonial people. And how it's caused political problems and continues to cause political problems even today. The elite were groomed, encouraged, funded to become more westernized become more Western universalism and this, this has been the British uh, as, the, uh, as the form of Western universalism has been replaced by the Americanization as the form of Western universalism 
and a huge amount of conversion into Christianity is going on very rapidly. Uh, not only in poor villages, but a lot of people in media and a lot of people elsewhere. And the Western universalism that is being uh, adopted in India is not just religion, it's also the secular version, the Marxist. Marxism is a Western import, it's not a Indian idea or a Chinese idea, it came from Europe. So the whole enlightenment movement, post-enlightenment movement, secular movement have become very popular. And these are having an effect on dharma. So in this book, what I'm, to, what I'm saying is that if we do not understand how we are different, if we do not know what difference matters, what is the difference that is important to preserve, if we don't have that difference, then we are being digested. So the antidote to being digested is being different. We're either being different or we're being digested. They're two opposites. And as we erase our difference, give up how we are, who we are, then we are getting more and more digested. That's the, those are the two opposites. We're either getting digested or we're different. Now the reason we're getting digested happily, voluntarily, and a lot of our spiritual leaders are facilitating being digested because they're going on saying we are the same. Being the same means that uh, there's less to, dif there's not much difference. So what's the, what's the problem? Why not just become like them? Because there's nothing unique. So this book is to explain major differences philosophically, philosophically, not symbols, rituals, we, we, we go barefoot, we eat on a banana leaf, we eat with our hands, we wear certain clothes. I'm not satisfied with those cultural surface differences. I'm looking for differences that are deeper philosoph philosophically. That's the kind of difference I'm looking at. So one example of a major difference is the Abrahamic religions are fixated on historical event, one unique historical event and the description of that historical event is in one book and memorizing and studying and believing that history will be my salvation. It's very interesting. I, uh, I went to Catholic school so I understand the Bible but when I came to this country, I came to North Carolina for my PhD in physics. So I used to make a lot of friends with people, local people and you know they didn't know that I understand Christianity quite well. I would basically discuss my faith but I understood their faith. You know? So I remember some people saying we'd like to, would you mind if we came and uh, read the Bible to you? So I said no, you can read it. So these people would come, they would sit there next to me and they would open the Bible and read a, a passage, then they would go somewhere else and read a passage. And basically each passage is some kind of historical story, a historical anecdote, there's no philosophical, it's just historical that he did this, he said that, and he said this, this one, and said don't do this, that, like that kind of thing. It's no, nothing, no philosophical, nothing to agree or disagree with philosophically, but some event being described. So after a few days of that, I was asked, how do you feel about it? I said, I feel okay. They said, well, what do you think of it? I said, well, this seems like interesting stories. So then they said, okay, you don't mind it? I said, no, I don't mind it. So then I was asked, would you mind? We'll do something a little different. You hold the Bible and we'll read it out. You mind holding it? I said, why? What's wrong? I'll hold it, of course. See, they were, they thought maybe, wow, and they were looking to each other like, wow, we've really got him now, you know? So he's holding the Bible. So I'm holding this and they would sit here and read it out and say, okay, turn the page to such and such page number and then I would turn it and then read it out. And then again, they would say, how do you feel? I said, oh, it's okay, I'm just reading it out. So then they said, would you mind, after a few days, they said, would you mind if you read it, you read it. 
So I'm gradually being brought into that, you know. So I said, oh, why? No problem. So I would read it. They would then point, of, okay, now read this verse. So I would read that verse. So then they said, so how, do you believe in this? Is this, does this appeal to you? So I said, I don't know what to say, but this is some people's story. And maybe it's true, it happened to them, but I don't know what it has to do with me. They just couldn't. So, our tradition is about oneself here and now. Me, who am I? What's my journey? Who am I? Who am I not? What do I do about myself? It's not about somebody else's history. It's not about somebody else's history. I never saw a yoga class start with all of us believe that there was a Patanjali, he lived in this year, he lived in this town. One day under a mango tree he was doing this asana and it cured this. So we believe in it and therefore it will cure us. It's not like that at all. You have to do it for yourself and see what happens to you. Yeah? The mantra is here and now, it will have an effect on you. The yoga is here and now, the sadhana is here and now. It's not somebody else's history, it's my present. So my advancement is through my present and the teaching is to help me achieve that present state. The teaching is not to memorize somebody else's history. The fact that X did this asana or Y did that mantra or whatever happened to him, I keep reciting that will do me no good. It's like instead of doing surgery on a patient, if you keep asking him to repeat that so and so had surgery done and it fixed him, it will not do any matter, do, make a difference. So, I call that mentality history-centric. That is what chapter 2 is about. History-centrism is where you access the truth through other people's history. You understand the truth through what is said to have happened to somebody else in time, somewhere else, thousands of miles away. Whereas the Indian, the dharmic approach is what I call Adhyatma Vidya, the inner knowledge, the inner knowledge of the self sadhana, through various uh, meditations, through various gyan and understanding of the knowledge. And it is not a subject of history, it is a subject of the nature of reality as it stands today. As it stands today. And so, the, I call this embodied knowing. Embodied means it's in the body. We are trying to understand this here and now because the body is something present now. So we are trying to understand through the body, through higher states of consciousness, through various sadhanas, various practices, they could be bhajans, they could be pujas, they could be mantras, they could be med yoga, whatever. Whatever practices you're using, they're all about me and now here. And they affect various levels of body, mind, body, different panch koshas, all the different levels. And it's through that that one is achieving, uh, uh, one is moving ahead and moving, uh, advancing spiritually. And it is not about the study of someone else that is going to help me. Now, it is not a trivial issue. The reason it is not a trivial issue is that in the Abrahamic religions, God is infinitely separated from man, infinite gap. And man cannot access that, bridge that gap. God chooses when he will communicate down and he always uses a prophet, intermediary. The prophet is like a spokesman or HR department that comes and announces that this is the policy for all of you. So then you have to believe that. And then the prophet is gone and there may not be another one. The prophets have finished. They're not coming anymore for a long time. They've, not, they've stopped coming. So the only access we have to the truth that God wants us to know is by studying the history of, what, of the prophets. So the history of old dead prophets is the only method available to understand the highest truth. Whereas in our tradition, each era gets some enlightened masters who evolve to a higher state of consciousness, achieve that unity consciousness and are able to teach us. And that is possible because the nature of man is Satchitanand. Everybody is Satchitanand. And since everybody is Satchitanand, everyone has that potential to get that knowledge. Even if 0.001% can get it, the point is in a hundred years there will be somebody and that somebody can then teach others. 
So we are always getting, we are updating the history to something more recent. Some more recent guy comes along. And so we are not dependent on something which is finished, closed, frozen forever, that can never change. We are not. So this characteristic, this huge difference between dependence on history in one system, history of other people, not verifiable, no way to go back and figure it out. What we lost, we lost. We can't get it back because it's gone. Versus our approach, the big difference. And in this way, I discuss, every chapter I discuss major differences between the Dharma traditions and the Western universalism. In the fifth chapter, I talk about Sanskrit non-translatables, which means words of Sanskrit that do not have an English equivalent. Like dharma is not religion. I give a huge explanation of why dharma is not religion. And there are even tables of dharma and religion, what is the difference? It's not, uh, you have to read to understand. Each civilization has its own experiences over time. And whatever they've experienced, they have a word for it. If they never experience something, they have no word for it. So, people, certain people in parts of India, they have dosa, because they have that, uh, they have dosa, so they have word for it. If you translate it as pancake, it's not the same thing. If you translate it as parantha or pizza, it is not the same thing. If you lose the word dosa and replace it with something else, after one or two generations, the chef will be giving you pancakes and saying that's dosa, you know. You lose the word, you lost the thing. So if you replace yoga with exercise, then you know after a while there will be just some exercise going on. Or gymnastics or prayer, it will not be the same thing. So preserving the word is very important. Even if a large percent of people are not going to be able to speak Sanskrit, certain words can be introduced into English and kept original words. Like Shakti, there is no English word for Shakti. Shakti should be kept as Shakti. It is not energy. Because this thing has got electrical energy, but energy is not divinity. Shakti has got divinity also. You see? So, you can't, if you replace Shakti with something else, you've distorted it. You kind of collapsed it, reduced it. It's not the same thing. I don't even like when people translate Atman as soul. Because in the Abrahamic religions, soul. Animals don't have soul. But in our tradition, Atman is in animals, even plants, even bacteria. Atman is there. So you're changing the meaning. When you replace Atman with soul, you're changing the meaning. And soul doesn't reincarnate. There's no reincarnation of soul. One life, no prior life. And after that, permanent heaven or hell, no reincarnation. So you're changing the ideas when you, just like if you take dosa and make it pancake, you're changing what it is. After a while, maybe the person who's an expert chef will say, look, I'll call it pancake, but I'll keep making dosa, I, I, I know. But then he'll have to teach somebody else who will be less knowledgeable, and he may mix it up with the pancake. And every generation, it'll become more and more like the pancake and less and less like the dosa. It'll be very difficult to preserve it. So, this is why Keeping Sanskrit words non-translated, certain Sanskrit words is very critical to be different and not be digested. And in the chapter 5, I give about 20 some examples of very important Sanskrit words. So if you do nothing else, just read that and understand those 20 words or read a, each word is described in 3, 4, 5, 6 pages, 8 pages, something like that. And even if you read one of those every week and make it part of your vocabulary, understand what it means. What, that, what does that word mean? And start utilizing it even in English. And question people when they use the translated version. Have the knowledge to argue that the English substitute you're using is not authentic. Have that knowledge and that confidence to debate. You will notice it gives you a huge empowerment about who you are. And it gives you a, a huge sense of, you know, confidence and security in being able to represent yourself because you have a certain word. 
caste is not a sanskrit word it is not an indian word it is a portuguese word casta in indian language in the sanskrit language we have jati and we have varna jati is a community so it's a certain community and by birth you are born into that jati but varna is not fixed by birth in the bhagavad gita krishna makes very clear that varna depends on your guna what kind of qualities you have as an individual and guna is dependent on karma so your karma will shape your character and and your character will shape what you are fit for in society what varna you can occupy and so in the same family the same brothers could be different varna because they have different qualities and in the same family in the same community one jati there will be people of many qual- kinds some are business oriented some are very uh, 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 you know political leadership oriented uh, control command oriented some are intellectual philosophically oriented teacher oriented like that so varna is not something fixed for a jati it is individual and the british there was a new darwin theory of evolution which said that uh, different species have uh, there is a survival of fittest and evolution of species and he was talking about non human and then herbert spencer turned it, that evolution theory into human cultures and civilizations some are superior some are inferior some races are superior some races are inferior and that developed something called race science in europe there was a field called race science in the 1800 second half of the 1800s all the universities were teaching race science it was considered very respectable and and that is the origin of nazism and all these the race kind of theories came and some of the people from europe british people who had these ideas were sent to india to do more research and figure out how to classify the indian races how to classify the indians in accordance with the european paradigm of race science so these people went around measuring skulls and noses and come up with different theories of how to characterize people and they came up with an idea that we have to stratify them according to uh, you know hierarchy of uh, their evolution and how evolved who's good and who's not good and those who are closest to the british would be considered the most superior and those who are less would be considered most inferior that was the criteria and so a sort of a location within the caste hierarchy was assigned by lord risley he was in charge of the census of india starting in 1871 or 1881 somewhere around there and every 10 years the census was done of the whole indian population they had to go to each village and ask the head of a jati to tell them that if you count how many people there are we have to add put it in our census and your jati has been given this name this caste and their level is such and such level so in this list of castes the lord risley assigned where your caste belongs so instead of fluid because the jati were very fluid in terms of economic structure they were went up and they went down so this is how when we lost the category jati and when we lost the category varna and we accepted we accepted the foreign category of caste it changed our society forever and after india was given independence indians adopted caste as a category in which to think about ourselves so today there is no excuse to continue thinking of caste but we do think of caste rather than jati and varna which is very different meaning if you change the language and think of jati and varna you will find that many of the problems that are there will not be there so we're using the wrong language and that is putting us in a certain framework where we can't solve these problems you see so those who are for or against an issue are both using just only as their frame of reference this is a problem so i'm i'm explaining to you what are some of the ways to understand our difference why understanding this difference is important because if we can keep this difference we can be pre- we can prevent digestion into western universalism and we can preserve our identity our continuity of heritage and we can play a role in helping humanity because our civilization brings a lot 
So what I will do is I could keep on talking but I would rather stop and take questions because then it's more interesting when we take questions. So thank you for listening and we should have people come here and ask their questions from here and then I will answer them. Thank you very much. My questions are very, very childish, maybe. No. Um, but there are questions anyway. You said the world of a person is determined from the guna, and the guna is determined by his karma. If the atma is coming from eons and with the anadi, atma is anadi, then where, where did the karma come from? Okay, very good question. Before we even talk about this, we have to talk about something first, else. The Atman manifests as a creature, manifests as a creature, and that manifested Atman is called Jeevatman. So Jeevatman is different than Atman. Okay? So Atman never changes, doesn't do karma, Atman doesn't suffer. Atman is the state when you are purely witnessing with no involvement, pure consciousness, that is Atman. And Atman is same as Brahman, Tattvamasi, Aham Brahmasmi. Now, Atman becomes many creatures. It becomes this ant, Jeevatman, this plant, Jeevatman, this Rajiv, Jeevatman. What is your name? Brinda. Brita? Brinda. Brinda. Brinda Jeevatman. So this is Jeevatman. Now the journey from life to life is a journey of the Jeevatman. This Jeevatman can adopt many forms. I have been born before as not only Indian and not only Punjabi. I have been born as black and Chinese and white and I have been born as a woman. I have been born as a dog and I have been born as a bird and I have been born as many ways. So, the experiences of all these are part of me, deep in my unconscious. That's why we have dreams, that's why we have hidden talents, that's why we have hidden fears, because we have carried a lot of memories and a lot of those things from way past thousands of lives. Yeah? When a person gets enlightenment, these enlightened people, they explain, they suddenly get a vision of their whole time, past, present, future, comes right bang. Yeah. So this is like the Virat Roop, the huge uh, opening of consciousness, then you suddenly realize how big you are. So the Jiva Atman in his journey is making choices as a human being, making choices between right and wrong, between going for the desire and not going for the desire, between being a philanthropist, doing good things, helping others or selfish, corrupt, whatever. So choices are being made and physics tells you that there is a cause effect. But physics only tells you one part of the effect. It tells you the effect which is immediate, immediate. But doesn't say that there is a trace left for future effect. Ah. So we have in karma causation is two part. One is something that will happen right now. So I go, I kick a guy and he'll be yelling and he will uh, yell at me and he will go somewhere. So that is the physics will say there's the effect. But physics will not say that there is also a karma and someday it will come back and haunt me. Physics doesn't know that. So karma theory says that there is that delayed effect also. So that delayed effect is sort of an account you're building for yourself. And you don't ever exhaust the account at the time of death because while some karma you're getting the consequences but then you're keeping on adding more karma yeah so you could say okay I slipped I fell that you know it was it was a very remarkable coincidence I don't know why I fell nobody else fell I just I just fell and okay maybe it was my problem it was supposed to happen but then while that particular karma has been paid off I am also walking around and creating many more yeah so this is the karma cycle going on Karma and effect and karma in effect. Now what this karma is doing is shaping my character. I am becoming a certain kind of person. This modern psychologists will call habit. They will call character. 
they will call your psychological predispositions. Modern psychology will un, will uh, uh, accepts that uh, you are based on your childhood experience and based on all these experiences, you've been shaped a certain way. We are taking the same principle and saying that not just childhood but even prior lives. Because otherwise, how would you explain the predisposition of a newborn? Somebody is born blind, somebody is born genius, somebody is born in a Bill Gates house and somebody is born in a poor house. You can't, you can't, moral, you can't give a moral explanation of si different situations at birth unless, you can, unless there is some accountability from the past. So karma follows you life to life and it shapes your guna, your quality, your character. And varna is simply based on what is good for your character. What are you suitable for? What type of work, what type of profession are you suitable for? So in the, in the long run, you are shaped by your own actions, which give you a character and that shapes your varna. Now a difficult question I will ask and see if somebody wants to answer it. If my varna is to be dependent only on my own actions, then why is it that uh, I'm born in a poor family and I'm, I'm poor because my family is poor? It seems my father's poverty is causing my poverty. Is that true? Do you think my father, father's poverty is causing my poverty? Or do you think my father's uh, being a fisherman is making me a fisherman because I have to be whatever my father is? Why do you think that, I, uh, that a, an average person in traditional society seems to be destined to be like his father or like his family? If it is his own personal karma, why is it his parents' karma influencing him? Can anybody answer that? It should not. It should not. But it is. People are born, gen people are born in bad circumstances. People are born, somebody is born in Bill Gates' house. But that's not because of my parents' karma. We choose our parents. That's the point. So, so, the answer to the question is, because of my karma, I had to suffer poverty. And therefore, I chose poor parents to be born. It's not that they made me poor. I had to be poor and therefore I selected them to be my parents. Do you see my point? Or I had to experience a huge amount of wealth. Maybe it will be good for me, maybe it will destroy me. But for whatever reason, I had to experience a huge amount of wealth. So, Bill Gates conceived me. Yeah, yeah. So the these lineages by birth is not because we have said that varna should be determined by birth, but you are born into a certain set of circumstances. That's it. Your past life merely determines the starting point where you will be born. After you are born you have the free choice to get out of it, to work it out. And a lot of people do. You see, you see what I'm saying? It's like uh, in, bay, in your accounts, in your company, your closing balance on December 31, if you have a calendar year, is your opening balance for the next year, January 1. So you are starting with that opening balance, but then you can change it during the year. You change your balance you, depending on how you run your business. So this idea was a very profound idea and an individual's journey was merit based and not because he's born in this, he's permanently going to be fixed in this. Over time, even before colonial rule, what happened in society is favoritism to one's own children, which happens now also. You know, George Bush family producing politicians and some corporate uh, tycoon producing billionaires and professors producing professors. This happens. Doctors producing doctors. Sitar family, Tabla family producing musicians, dancers, many generations. People will say, I'm, for five generations we've been from this gharana. So this is, this is normal because the parents have a tendency to sort of pass on whatever they know best to their kids. So both the birth-based influences are there to shape you and to sort of make it easy for you to continue in a certain way as your parents and your individual free will is there to change. Both are there. Uh, today, 
modern society has given educational opportunities so that in the public school everybody sitting getting the same education so you could be from a tailor's family and this guy could be from a big corporate family you sitting in the same class and you may end up being richer than this guy it happens all the time as modern society comes but what happened during the recent history is because of lack of social mobility yeah people were more or less destined to follow their family tradition their family occupation and the british turned this into that this is what hindus are required to do and we bought it by by giving it hindu calling it hindu caste telling the purohits and the teachers and the acharyas and they all hindu caste uh they made it look like we are doing the right thing by continuing this rigid caste system that's how we became rigid caste system so it's a very complex topic but recovery of our own categories of varna and jati is a very powerful strategy to get out of these problems rather than continuing to use the caste idea as a framework so i need more questions please come and you hold two of these double barrel yeah i hope i can pretty much oh uh, it seems that uh, historically at least in recent history we in india are not very good in building organizations very but good. as a good i like to think i'm a good to do and in india it it kind of hurts me that uh, we are not very well united so i want to get your opinion on why we are not very well organized in united What we do? Because like this kind of conversation, I would expect thousands of people here. Yes, that's because I'm not Shahrukh Khan. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, this is so deep and so far from the world changing philosophy that we need to be united. So first of all, why are we not united? Second thing, I my concern is whenever I go to temples and stuff, I see that I'm on the younger side of population. I'm concerned that our younger generation, uh, they are not. as the participants as they should be because this is deep and simple stuff and uh, what can we do in terms of education and like organizing this in part academia and education as opposed to all the responsibility going to parents and one on one we give and still stay divided so sort of building an education society kind of thing and so that younger generation gets this with a lot of inclusion i think these are these are two excellent questions first one why but it is a fact that the west has mastered institution building corporate institution building and there's a history of it the church positioned itself as the intermediary between man and god like the broker like we have a franchise to distribute god's what god is marketing given us the franchise exclusive franchise so we have the agency to distribute god and this means you have to come through us so this idea that church has the power exclusive power uh for for all religious matters gave it the money the clout taxation you know all of that to create a very powerful institution so for thousands of years they had the advantage of having that exclusive monopoly over the lives of people and so they built a very powerful institution now all western institutions are modeled after the church you may not realize that before the british east india company when they studied multinational corporate history they like to talk about british east india company as a role model for multinationals today that they all followed the articles of incorporation and bylaws and shareholders and board meetings and resolutions and how you how you govern a multinational uh, british east india company perfected it but before the british east india company there were people like the knights templar which is medieval era multinational run by the vatican vatican had its own multinationals they perfected the idea of multinational they were into various businesses all over so British East India Company also derived a lot of its models from that and the institutional 
mechanisms of the church start with the Romans. It's not Jesus. Jesus is not an institution builder and is not uh, people in Jerusalem. It is when the Romans in the 4th century, they take over Christianity and Romanize it. And that's when the New Testament is born and that's when Christianity is born, the church is born as an instrument of the emperor's ruling, you know, strategy, ruling authority, ruling style. So the, the institutional experience of the West is very deep. And it's not that Western religions are institutionalized. It is that Western, Western religions create an institution concept. And corporate institution, business institutions came later. Governments, government institutions are a spin-off from the time when the Holy Roman Empire was the church and the government all combined in one. So the origin of institutions, including government institutions, including uh, you know corporate institutions, all linked with the church, all common origin. So you must understand that we didn't have that. We didn't have a very centralized, authoritative, uh, exclusive institution that runs your life. Even the king, the Kshatriya king, did not have the authority to determine your dharma. It says. Many times it says in our traditions that the king must let everybody have their own dharma. It says very clearly that everybody can have his own dharma. There is no state dharma. Ashoka had uh, Buddhism as his state dharma, but Hindu rajas allowed every community to have its own dharma. So there is a separation of Brahmin and Kshatriya, very old in Indian system, which is now called separation of church and state. As, as if it's a Western idea. But the separation of Brahmin representing the spiritual life and Kshatriya representing the state is equivalent idea and it's a very old idea. And that is why the Varnas are separate. A Brahmin cannot be the Kshatriya. If a Brahmin were to take over the Raja job, he has to stop being the Brahmin. He has to resign from being the Brahmin. He cannot have both the jobs at the same time. Conflict of interest. This is a very interesting point. So we kept, we, our model, which is explained in this, in chapter 4 of this book, I talk about, in chapter 4 is called Order and Chaos. I talk about how the Dharma model is a very decentralized model. So every Jati is ruling on its own, every village is ruling on its own. There is very limited authority from a central source. So the central emperor had some, on some matters he'll intervene and run your life. But on a lot of matters, the local guy is running their own life, doing whatever. This is why India is so hospitable to anybody coming in, settling down. So easy to invade, so easy to invade. The weakness it causes is fragmentation. It means that there is no, since there is no one solid guy running the show, the advantage is that there is nobody, nobody denying you your rights and you can be very creative. And you can, be, Indians are very good in decentralized small groups. Very difficult to organize a large group of Indians and make them operate. And you have to use Western models. So that's why people like Infosys and all that use Western management style. Because Indians left to themselves, everybody will improvise. You tell you want a million copies of pants or shirt, then and you have a large number of tailors, they all improvise, somebody will put buttons this way, that way, you know, everybody is very creative. The raga is played differently, the chef is making creative improvisation. Artists doing a little separate thing. Indians are very creative for that reason. But if you want mass produced, standardized, organized control, then this same creativity also becomes a handicap. So the Western culture excelled in something and we excelled in something else. The Western culture excelled in collective, systemic, organized, uh, orderly, top down control. And we specialized in everybody can think for himself, everybody's, uh, you know, individualistic and improvise. That's why when I used to be in business, I used to have meetings sometimes with Indians and Westerners sitting around talking about some software project or something. And Indians all talking to every, each other simultaneously. So one is talking to two and three is talking to five and six is talking to one and two and three is listening to two and talking to four, like that. And the Westerners would be so 
dumbfounded and so shocked they would just sit quietly and just keep look, listening like that, not knowing what is going on. Yes. So then the meeting would be over and then one white guy would come to me and say, Rajiv, I did not know what happened. I don't know what is going on. I have no idea what is going on. And the Indians very relaxed about it because they are, everybody figured out, filtered out, connected this, that, filled in some gap, improvised, come up, gone to his office and know what to do. Yeah? This is very true for those of you who have been in international teams. And I give this seminar to corporate people nowadays. Tell them this, you have to understand this. So I used to have two meetings. I used to have a meeting. First is a brainstorm. So I tell the Indian, you can keep talking, doing do everything like that. Whatever you want to do is fine. And then I say, okay, now, then I would get one of the white guys and say, now, you guys stop. You go on the board and you write down number one, two, three, four, we do this, we do that, we don't do this, this guy does that. So you make it orderly, systematic, linear thinking. Yeah? And like, this guy is much better than the Indian at doing that. He's very organized and systematic at doing that. So you get the best of both. Now, actually, there is a huge weakness in dharma in this regard and you picked a very important point. We have to be conscious of it and do something about it collectively. The weakness is that dharma assumes people of a certain character to be self-compliant. Like if you have a library with an honor system, nobody is policing, no security guard looking at what you are taking out. It is an honor system built on, based on your own character that be, when, before you leave the book you sign out your name. Yeah? Or you have a joint family with a common money sitting there and everybody take out the money and uh, list it. Something like that. Or you have a temple where nobody is policing because you are supposed to behave for yourself. Now if you have a system of that kind, it's meant for people who are evolved up to a certain level. And for people who are evolved up to a certain level, a self-policing, self-discipline is better than cops policing over you heavy-handed. Yeah? But what if, what if the average level of thinking is not so evolved? It has become degenerate like it has. Then, then leaving people alone to do the right thing might not work because there will be corruption, somebody is abusive, somebody is taking advantage, somebody is stealing, they are doing all those things. So you see, the dharma civilization assumed people of a certain caliber, especially leaders, especially leaders. So if, those, if that caliber is gone and now you have a bunch of crooks, you have a bunch of crooks, then that same system won't work. So our civilization has to adopt some western ways because they adopted, they evolved these ways because their culture did not have that evolution. They did not have those advanced yogis and rishis and those kind of leaders. They had a bunch of guys, you know, pretty crude level and so they had to develop systems to control them and police them and heavy military and all that stuff. You see? So, do you know that in the vast majority of Indian villages, there is no police station today. There is no police station. More than 50% of the villages. The first thing that they put up in a small town in USA, even with a population of 500, is a flag and a police station. Every place has a police station. When you tell this to people, they are mostly self-policed. Disputes are sorted out by some local elders, even now. So you see, self-management, self-organized, I am explaining these concepts in chapter 4, is wonderful, provided the people have the caliber to be, uh, to be self-disciplined. So today, our problem is, we don't have either advantage. We don't have the advantage of the strong disciplines enforcing on people, like the West has. And we don't have the advantage of self-character, high character, to do it for, to be self-organized either. So we are neither here nor there. This is a very serious problem. And understanding that this is a problem means we can then begin to do something about it. So first we have to learn institution building. Many of our dharma spiritual organizations are very poor at, really, at institution building. What happens, you know, the, the Shankara Matha, the very rare example of continuity of an institution for so many years. But most uh, examples are when the guru who started it dies, then it's all shim, mil, uh, mishmash, inner fighting, 
they will like political parties rivals split and make different parties so the different disciples will split and start fighting each other and create many rival organizations when a guru dies that's what happens there's very little institutional continuity institutional continuity means that you are not dependent on the charisma of any individual it is not a personality cult you say like vatican does not depend on the personal spiritual elevation of the pope he is a kshatriya and a ceo simple as that he is a kshatriya and a ceo his own state of consciousness and how high he is and what is his moral standing is not a factor in determining the corporate success of the vatican because it's an institution run like a corporate body they have lawyers they have uh, management people they have uh, it people they have marketing people they have all kinds of these kind of people and they run like a corporate with strategy business plans budgets all that that's how they run that's how churches are run if you go to a church and try to figure out they run in a very corporate style but our uh, our tradition is not run like that you know it's not run like that is run on the huge character dependence on the individual character and how much bhakti and how much shraddha you have and how how genuine you are and how giving you are of yourself unattached you are up to the results like that all those are character qualities and as long as that character remains that particular movement continues from generation to generation but when that character comes to an end and degrades and falls apart like has happened then that movement falls apart and we're seeing that happening in so many movements now that is my analysis of what the situation is what do we do you know for 20 years i have been doing this full time this is not a hobby it is not a weekend job i was 44 and i was very successful in business i had many many companies and i had a spiritual experience of my own that convinced me that i want to give up all of that and pursue my pursue only one thing in the rest of my life i felt i am very lucky and i only want to serve my dharma learn study write teach and so since that age of 44 and now i'm 61 so for 17 18 years i've done this 6 7 days a week and this is all i do now i'm amazed at how rare how difficult it is to get support to have pe- from people who can easily afford it who have the means who even have the conviction who even have the ideas but for some reason they are in a rat race that is never ending that attachment to more and more and more is without limit so you know people can be dharmic in terms of uh, you know superstitious reasons that they want they, they want the goodies that they, and so it's more like a transactional tra- i call it transactional hinduism i'll go and give 51 dollars and i'll get this i'll ask for something something for my daughter's marriage my son's career my business my health my family i want something and for that i'm pledging i'll give this so it's like you hire a consultant and fix it for you so the deity is like a intermediary that you bribing so it's a bribe system this kind of a thing while we have a philosophy of enlightenment and giving up attachments and going beyond all these things and being selfless and not looking for rewards we have all that philosophy but the practice of hinduism for most people is basically looking for something personal that people want out of it or an insurance policy that nothing wrong should happen to me i don't want anything new but everything should continue like this business as usual kind of thing this is the this is not what our tradition calls for as the reason for bhakti and the reason for faith and the reason for sadhana so i would say a large part of the problem why the kids haven't followed is because our own people uh, the parents have not practiced our dharma properly so the kids are not they don't have the right role models the the we want we want someone else to do something not ourselves so we are waiting that okay somebody else will look after my kids i'll put them in bal vihar they look after it or i'll put them in tennis camp or i'll put them here or maybe they'll watch tv and play nintendo and they'll grow up fine so you know we have we have been busy doing something else which is very selfish building our own life and our own career and the kids are left to something else and then we are wondering you know why aren't they following our footsteps because maybe we haven't lived the life ourselves and we are expecting they should live the life sure both of these i have two questions again um the first one is uh, just yesterday a group of uh, friends we were having a dinner and we had a similar discussion and uh, if the elders are not following the um, 
spiritual lifestyle. How are the kids going to, uh, what are the kids going to emulate? What are they going to emulate and where are they going to get that inspiration from? Are the guidelines from? Uh, that was a question. Like, if, so, because we do not have an institutionalized way of following a spiritual lifestyle, how are we going to make ourselves do it and then pass it on to our kids? That's a major question we had yesterday. And the second question I have is, again going back to the karma, if the karma is the determining factor for my next step, should I be also going and bobbing in front of a God or should I be concentrating only on the karma and not worry about anything else spiritually? The second question is more, uh, I'll, I'll, an I'll answer that first, then I'll come to the first question. But both are very good questions. I'm very grateful to you. Thank you so much. So, the question is bhakti or karma? Yeah? Now, the beauty of our tradition is that we have many paths available. And you can choose the path that fits for you. Swami Vivekananda created this four like imagine a building with four doors. He said Raj Yog, Karm Yog, Bhakti Yog, Gyan Yog. So you are asking about which is better Bhakti Yog or Karma Yog. You could also talk about Raj Yog which is meditation and achieving through chakras and meditation and achieving high state of consciousness. And you could also ask about Gyan Yog which is knowing by, by mere knowing so much and, and actually knowing the unity consciousness and living with that idea that we are all unified and in every moment being that way, that is a path also. I, my guru said the, uh, and lived the example and taught us the example which the best evidence of my guru is that it changed my life. And I gave up for 18 years and never looked back and I gave up quite a lot and I'm very happy I did that. That's a very good example, very good testimony that at least for this person it worked and I'm very happy. So the teaching was that bhakti for those who are emotional, who, who have love in them and rather than loving another person, then it becomes moha means attachment, expectation. Even loving your children, you should, but loving your children can become expectation and driven and attachment in the sense that I'll get something out of it later on, they'll do this for me, they'll make me look proud, I can show off, and they'll look after me, they'll continue my business. All of that is attachment. It's not, we call it love, but it is attachment. And love for spouse is also, there's some expectation that, okay, then you know, I'll get something back. So, whereas if you channel that desire for love towards the Lord, then that, that is a different level of love. That's a whole different level of love. And the love for the Lord, pure love, is not for give me this in return. I have people who tell me, I've given up uh, Hinduism. So I said, why? They said, because I did uh, this yagna and gave $101 and didn't get, I didn't get through the exam and it doesn't work, God, I don't believe in God. So it's like uh, the consultant is no good, I'll hire a different consultant. It's that kind of thing. My mother's maid in Delhi comes from the northeast. I pick up very quickly that she's converted. Nobody in the family guessed it. She's been there for seven, eight years. We were just sitting once. She got a Hindu name. So I said in Hindi, I asked her, so when did you get baptized? I just, that was my first question. And she was very, she big smile. She said, oh, on such and such year, such and such, she answered her. And my, relatives sitting around were dumbfounded, like, whoa, how we didn't know that, kind of thing. So then I kept on having a nice conversation with her, that, okay, so did you get baptized alone, or your family? She said, no, my whole family, we all got baptized together. So I said, oh, okay, this is very interesting, so uh, what made you get baptized? So she says, my mother was very seriously ill, and we went to the mandir, and we prayed, and the pandit told us, do this and that donation, whatever, and we did that, and uh, he got even worse. And then father came to our house and said, I'll pray for you. And you know, a week later she, she got okay. So then he came back and said that now because Jesus has saved you, you have to become Christian, otherwise you may fall ill worse. So he put that fear also. So we all converted. So this is one kind of religion and Krishna calls it tamasic religion. This is tamasic religion. This is religion for 
and we have a lot of tamasic religion also and this is a religion where you are doing something to get something back transactional that's not real bhakti so if it's real bhakti it is a very good way of channeling your emotional predisposition towards a higher you know uh, object of bhakti the lord then karma can be at many levels also the level where you are doing something to help people poor people or needy people or hospitals and you have an expectation like let me tell you a lot of philanthropy is corporate pr it's not genuine art from the heart it's corporate pr i know this because i hang around that circle and it is corporate pr it's like you get on a board and then you get deals you help now with people of a certain strata because you are in this certain level of giving and only people of a certain level of giving will be in that club and they'll have dinner together and then they'll have a photo opportunity with the governor and what not and so basically you know these big billionaires who are uh, giving large amount of philanthropy from india they want to join some high big league where they can cut big deals so there is one level of karma yoga which is purely selfish motivated but real karma yoga is without wanting anything back then there is a higher level than that also higher level than that is that it is not mine to give it is not my money to for, in the first place like a bank trustee bank employee is a trustee looking after somebody's trust account in in spending it wisely so this money when it was earned was just in use for me as a trustee it is not my money and i have to use it for the general well being yeah so when we give i'm not the giver i'm just a trustee who's doing this and it's not my deed and i want nothing for it that's more than just the next this beyond even that selfless giving because in selfless giving at least you feel i give you feel i gave i gave and oh i'm selfless you know i am so cool i actually gave and i'm selfless but but that register inside the transaction has registered the cash register inside has done ding ding i have given okay whereas i never it was never mine to begin with when i did the work i was doing a seva and whatever came from the work i came empty in this world i'm going to leave empty from this world whatever work i was doing was seva it was nishkam it was without karta bhav and that money that came is going to flow through me for whatever the right causes are as per the best i can figure out but it's sort of like you are operating your head of a trust and it is that particular trust money and you just helping out as a volunteer doing the job to manage the trust so if your karma yoga is like that it is of a higher kind so now there is an even higher level than that the higher level than that is that this is brahma and i am having this this patient is brahman who's come for an operation i'm doing or this client who's called and i'm saying hello i'm going to call him john because otherwise he'll think i'm weird but i know this is brahman's form that has called so in every interaction with another person you basically remind yourself that this is a form of god that is present and this way you begin to live that you are surrounded by god in many many forms your relatives your friends your enemies your enemies one of one of my one of my many transformations happened and i don't tell stories but once in a while i'll tell them my personal stories i was in a a situation in my business where somebody was really after me for a totally unreasonable you know there's people who are strange people they 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 want to have a fight with you and no matter what you do it's unsolvable i mean they're making a completely unreasonable demand and no amount of reason logic pleading will work so i had all this rattling me so i asked my guru what you are do and i'm this fighter type would give it back so my guru said the question is the wrong question what am i to do you are to do nothing 
because as long as Rajiv the ego wants to do something there will be a reaction and you will be facing Rajiv the ego will be facing the consequences of doing. So first thing you have to understand is that next time you meet this guy before you say anything you should say this is Brahman who has visited me and he's come to fight with me and this is Brahman who fight with me and I have to keep that in mind keep that attitude in mind and I will also do what I have to do but I am doing also Brahman's form well, this is Brahman's form see the Kauras and Pandas are all both Brahman's form the Devas and Asuras are both Brahman's form the snake that eats the rat is a Brahman's form eating Brahman's form as rat that is what this world is like Brahman as Gunas in combat and encounter with other Brahman as Gunas yeah same Brahman as many many entities the doer and the one who is being done to are all Brahman the one who is doing the deed and to whom you are doing it is also Brahman if you can keep reminding yourself of that and begin to sort of become second nature to you it can change you so I thought okay I have taken the pledge that I'll do what the Guru says and there's so many experiences I had where I just went just like jumping blind into the swimming pool without knowing how to swim because somebody says go for it so I decided I'll go for it the strangest thing happened I had this feeling towards this person and this person is a very kind of mean guy very strange thing happened he opened his mouth and he said Rajiv we don't even have a problem a very amazing thing it's like it affected him in some way he didn't even want to fight because nobody want to always fight with me but this time he didn't he didn't want to have any fight he said you know I've been thinking we really don't have a problem complete change of heart I was so amazed I don't know how it happened I have no idea how it happened but this happened so I noticed that this sometimes it is the gurus who can anticipate what is right for you sometimes they have a certain grace that can interfere and do things for you to give you a moral to give you support and encouragement in that way to change your character from being the fighter spirit to being something a little different you see what I'm saying so then I I've been through a lot of these experiences I can keep telling you about but bhakti and karma become the same thing because when I am bowing before the Lord and wanting nothing and versus when I am doing something which is I am not really doing but I, something some action is flowing through me through this who is also Lord's form it's the same thing it's also bhakti then karma turns into bhakti too karma turns into bhakti so when you do anonymous anonymous like in the satsang we used to have in Haridwar they don't want anybody's money they don't want to make you feel that you done something you can privately go just quietly go and buy the whole kitchen supplies and quietly put it in the kitchen and just go off at five o'clock in the morning nobody will know that you even done it and with the feeling this is all Brahman's form who are going to be eating it and this money is not mine in the first place now is that karma or is that bhakti I think it's both you see what I'm saying so these different uh, paths you know these uh, Mayan pyramids are four sided so from each side you can climb any of the four sides but at the top you are in the same place so bhakti will take you to the same place as karma if you really follow it that way more questions Namaste. Uh, I attended uh, Raj's lecture uh, today morning at Chinmay Mission and also the debate in the University of Toronto uh, and two youth who asked you the questions uh, little further to that I would like to ask nowadays when I hear the sermon saying I switch on TV to listen to the pastors and uh, you know church people and more and more they are saying uh, about spirituality so I read your book and I wanted to know is there really a spirituality in Abrahamic religion well you know spirituality has been there 
but dominated in the, in the Abrahamic religions, dominated by the institutional authority and the institutional edicts, the standardization, the requirement to fall in line and have one homogeneous belief structure, rigid belief structure, that has dominated the spirituality. Spirituality would mean, my, I am, in the Indian sense, spirituality would mean I don't need an institution, I don't need an authority. I can, I am doing, I have my own personal equation with the divine. It's within me. I go and offer and do pujas and do various things. And each of them, I am getting more and more connected with the divine within, even though I'm taking an external action. When I'm doing a yagna outside, the outer action is correlated with inner transformation. So I'm really doing it for, as an inner process. And it may seem I'm, help, I'm doing something to a God outside, but that action outside is correlated to a transformation within. So this true spirituality would dilute the power of institutional mechanisms like church. So they have a real problem. They want to, on the one hand, be very politically correct and they want to be very trendy. They know that this trend is powerful, yoga is powerful, but they also know that if you go into too advanced a yoga, you don't need the church anymore. They know that. So they, are, they have a hard time uh, dismissing these things because the consumer walks away. The church member walks away when you say, don't do these things. Because these things are very fashionable. And these are Indian influence from the 60s, the hippies, they are kind of Indian influence. So they are giving lip service to these things. But I have a big uh, debate going on with scholars from the church and theologians and pastors to get them to define what they mean by this spirituality and how does it fit into things which are very history centric, very dogmatic, are they willing to give that up and they are not. So there is a double sidedness to that. My question is uh, concerning India. Like, I have been with uh, Rajiv for the last few days and we have tried to, like I mean, my journey with him, we have, uh, I've seen so many questions being raised. But like, eventually I, I want to know, like, you know, you can improve your karma, you, you do the right thing and you can improve your karma. You have the caste system in India, you have the corruption in India. And uh, so, is there any kind of a Ram bond? Like, I mean, if a tree is uh, suffering, so you improve the soil and, you know, uh, you pour the insecticide or pesticide, whatever, and the tree starts flowering again. So, is there uh, one single remedy uh, and uh, to get an instant result or something which, in the short term, we can uh, foresee that you know this will eventually uh, bring back India to the its uh, lost, uh, long lost world and glory? So, uh, I would be, I would appreciate if you can answer. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Um, you know, India is at the crossroad and could go either way. The gloom and doom scenario we must understand. We can't dismiss it because only when you understand the disease, then the, then the doctor can cure it. You, know, you must have a good diagnosis. So there is a lot of problem that India is facing. And as a result of that, Population is going, well, we have a growing population, we need more and more food, but we don't have a growing land supply, we don't have a growing water supply. The northern rivers could be threatened by China taking over Brahmaputra and Nepal has Ganga water and uh, Kashmir has uh, Indus water. So there's a lot of problems and the Breaking India book talks about the internal fragmentation and the foreign next interventions to break things up and divide and conquer going on. And the caste system has fragmented the vote banks and governments are unstable and all that stuff. So, India could have serious problems and in that case, the scenario would be we would get digested into Western Universalism, certain large parts and into Islamic Universalism, other large parts. And a lot of Indians would be happy to kind of become second grade Westerners and a lot of other Indians would be happy to become second grade part of Islamic Universalism. And so, India could become a hotbed of uh, wars and insurrections and breakups, it can happen. It is not uh, beyond uh, the realm of possibilities. That is quite possible to happen. 
On the other hand, if India can get over these problems, get its act together, solve its internal social problems, solve the internal uh, you know, identities that are fragmenting the country, breaking it up, identities that are now loyal more to foreign nexus than to their own motherland. Uh, India, if India can get these things together and create a, a renaissance of the dharma civilization, then not only can India thrive, but India can be a beacon to the rest of the world and be an example of harmony on a global scale, environmentalism, respect for nature, respect for animals, sustainability, all these I didn't get to talk, uh, but these are all some of the great ideas that India can contribute to world civilization. So India could go either way. I think therefore I have given my life from that moment on when I decided till I, I, as long as I live to give it the best I can to my, do my best. Now to make this happen, it's not one silver bullet that we can shoot and boom it will be happen. We need a critical mass of such people. We need a large number of such people who are informed, intelligent, very sharp and hard working, selflessly giving and want to just go for this. We need to get more people like that. We need to collect such people. And so that's my swadharma. Everybody has their swadharma. My swadharma is to research positions that are provocative, which I can defend with all the substantiation and backup you need, which will inform people of things they hadn't thought of before and to go around as wherever they invite me to go and talk and let them have books and videos and powerpoints and whatever they want that I'm able to produce. The idea being that all I would like to see is more interested people, more awakened people who are then once you have a critical mass, you can do things. If we have a critical mass in Toronto, I, we can do things, but we need solid support and we need in enough numbers and with good solid amount of resources that we can pull together. So once we have that, we can come up with actions, but alone I don't know what I could do. A lot of people think I am some devata and they'll say, okay, Rajiv, you're a devata, you do this. And I tell them, don't outsource your purusharth to me. This is your purusharth, you have to do it. And sometimes they get very angry, even if, just because I wrote back a one-liner saying, good idea, do it. They think that I'm, uh, uh, you know, some guy that is, uh, why am I asking them to do it as if it's something wrong. So our people are shirking the responsibility, a lot of people. Only a small number of people have big hearted and really doing things. Like I'm so happy to see people making this kind of place. I'm so happy to see this. But you know, it takes a very few people are really that uh, giving and with that scale of thinking. We need more people who are thinking beyond themselves, thinking far into the future, thinking of humanity at large, our tradition. We need more people before we can come up with good solutions to that problem. With that, I would like to thank all of you for coming and listening. It's been a wonderful experience. Thank you.